Welcome everyone to the Campaign for Social Science annual lecture. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm chair of the Campaign for Social Science and it's a huge pleasure for me to be hosting our annual lecture this year from Professor Trish Greenhorsch. Uh, it's actually our second lecture in 2020. As we held over our 2019 lecture by BBC Home Editor Mark Easton as we were a bit thrown uh, by the snap election at the end of last year. Um, that felt like a major disruption at the time. <laughs> So uh, if only we knew what was coming. Uh, but it's great for the campaign to have two such brilliant speakers in the same uh, calendar year. And Trishy's lecture couldn't be more timely and important in terms of its subject and focus, all more aligned with some of the key themes for the campaign strategy this year. Trishy's lecture is called Give Me Back My Fact. And it's a very personal and compelling outline of what happens when scientific facts meet society in the incredibly high pressure situation of a global pandemic. Uh, this interaction between science and social science and how we can only get a full understanding of what to do from combining both has been at the right, right at the heart of the campaign's focus uh, for this year. For those of you who may not know, the campaign is part of the Academy of Social Sciences and was formed as a key initiative with just one objective, uh, to promote the vital role of social science in improving decision-making society and lives. Uh, and it relies entirely on the support of a host of individuals and groups who are working in the sector, including our excellent Academy Fellows, a number of universities and learned societies, Sage Publishing as our lead commercial sponsor, uh, an excellent board drawn from across the sector supporting our work, and of course, a small but very dedicated staff, including our excellent Chief Executive, Rita Gardner. Um, so since the spring, our focus has been on our COVID hub of hubs, uh, which has looked to bring together the best of universities, think tanks, what work centers, lots of other organizations, hubs, their own hubs in one place, not creating new hubs, but just providing a central place to go to. And when you see it all together, it is a real reflection of how social science mobilized so quickly to actively shape governments and other responses. Um, the hub also includes over 40 common pieces from some of our most prominent social scientists, uh, from Jeff Mulgan and Andy Haldane to Sujim Nikki and Becky Francis. Uh, video interviews with people running major studies informing the COVID response from Paul Johnson at the IFS to Alyssa Goodman at UCL. Uh, showcasing our, you know, the UK's brilliant longitudinal studies and a series of events on some of the big questions, um, including on how data and evidence are used in practice with Sarian Diamond and Alison Park, uh, among many others. Um, we've posted a link in the chat to the hub. Do keep an eye on it uh, for now, but also into 2021, where we have an, a, a, another ambitious program uh, for next year. But first, we have uh, the pleasure of Trishy's lecture. And at a personal level, Trishy's themes are of huge interest to me. Uh, my focus is on perceptual biases and how they interact with identity and polarization. And the crisis has brought some of that to the fore, as Trish will outline. Uh, after Trish, we're also delighted to have a response from Dr. Mili Zimbata, who uh, introduced, well, I'll introduce properly later after Trishy's talk. Then we'll have around half an hour to take questions from the audience. Um, do get in early though, uh, using the Q&A functions. There are a lot of attendees still coming in. Uh, uh, so early submission is best um, and we will do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, and do tweet uh, as we go through the hashtag is just campaign lecture 20. Uh, but before we start, I want to introduce Katie Metzler, who's Associate Vice President at Sage Publishing, who's one of our key supporters and Katie's uh, one of our excellent board members at the campaign. Uh, with Sage's support, um, including the sponsorship of this annual lecture for a number of years now. So, Katie, over to you. Thank you, Bobby, and welcome, everyone. For those of you who aren't familiar with Sage Publishing, we're an independent academic publisher, and our mission is to build bridges to knowledge. One of the ways that we aim to do that is through events like this one and others we've run in partnership with the campaign that are free and open to everyone and that discuss key issues facing society and the role of the social sciences in helping us to understand and tackle those issues. And if there was ever a year with issues, 2020 is it. I think I speak for most of us when I say that it's not a year that I would return to willingly. It's been a year of fear, uncertainty, and for far too many, of profound grief. 
But 2020 is also the year that the global scientific community came together to deliver an extraordinary scientific achievement. The development of a highly effective vaccine for COVID produced in under 12 months. It's also the year the US president said that thing about bleach, while we all educated ourselves on our numbers and exponential growth. It's a year where misinformation has been rife, but also the year that 270 million people around the globe read articles published by The Conversation, a news website where all of the articles are written by academics. This year, our TVs and newspapers have been filled with academic experts, helping us to understand what's happening around us. Epidemiologists, virologists, and public health experts, but also social scientists, like Professor Stephen Reicher, who's emerged as an authoritative voice in the debates over lockdown policies in the UK. When SAGE released the book Stephen Reicher co-edited on the psychology of COVID-19, called Together Apart, for free on the website Social Science Space, it was downloaded 50,000 times. And over 2,500 people registered for tonight's lecture. And I think what all of this tells us is that in an age of memes and misinformation, and in a time of crisis and uncertainty, there's a huge countering hunger for information that's serious, in-depth, and produced by, yes, experts. And we have two such experts here with us tonight. And the topic of tonight's lecture and the speakers we have joining us couldn't be more perfect because together they represent something that's become abundantly clear through this pandemic, which is that a pandemic, like so many of the other really big and pressing issues facing us, such as structural racism or climate change, are not just problems to be faced by one discipline or sector alone. Of course, a global pandemic is a medical crisis, but there's a big difference between developing a vaccine and vaccination. And that difference is fundamentally social. This year, our social world has been reshaped and recovery from this pandemic will require disciplines to work together and the social sciences are essential to this effort. This is evidenced by the fact that 20% of all of the National Science Foundation funding on COVID went to social science research and why the Economic and Social Research Council in the UK has funded over 170 projects on COVID. I think there's no doubt that as a result of the events of 2020, the research agenda of social scientists will change profoundly. And as awful as this year has been, it does feel like there is a huge opportunity here for the whole to become greater than the sum of its parts and for us to work together across disciplines and sectors so that specialists can bring their expertise and insight together, not just to cope with the current crisis, but to help promote a regrowth of culture, society and economy in ways that enable future generations to flourish. As an academic publisher committed to the dissemination of high quality social science research, we at SAGE take our role in supporting this effort really seriously. And that's why we're so delighted to be bringing this event to you alongside the campaign. So thank you all for coming and I'll hand back to Bobby to introduce you to our keynote speaker. Thank you, Katie, that was great. Um, so we all want to get on swiftly for, uh, to hear from Trish, so I won't give a long introduction to her incredible career. We were just talking before the session there about Trish was telling us about a lecture in Japan she gave where the host read out all 27 pages of her full academic CV and I'm, I won't do that uh, right now. Uh, but just to say Trish is a Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences and Fellow of Green Templeton College at University of Oxford. She studied medical, social and political science at Cambridge and then clinical medicine at Oxford before training as an academic uh, general practitioner. She leads a program of research, fascinating program of research at the interface between social science and medicine. Um, and she's used all of this experience during the COVID-19 um, pandemic, looking at that interplay between science, society and policy. Uh, and she's clearly just been one of the key people to follow during the pandemic. So we are delighted to have you here, Trish, and over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Bobby. I'm just uh, doing the screen share thing and I'm hoping you can all see my screen now. Um, so yes, the title, Give Me Back My Fact. How can social science help us survive the post-truth pandemic? Uh, and I want to start with uh, some thank yous. Um, thank you to everyone listening. There's hundreds of you who have given up your afternoon. Um, without you, there wouldn't, of course, be a lecture. 
Thanks to Bobby for chairing. Thanks to Sage for sponsoring. To Millie, who's going to respond to my lecture today. To Marta and her team at the Campaign for Social Science for supporting me as I've, I've prepared this lecture, but also for the work you do for social science generally. And also a quick mention to my funders, which currently include Health Foundation, Wellcome Trust, ESRC, NIHR and MRC. So what I wanted to do first of all is just take the title of my talk and give you some dictionary definitions of the terms, uh, which is a little bit boring at the beginning, but I think we all do need to know what we're talking about by, by the title. Um, so the dictionary tells us that a fact is a thing that is known or proved to be true. Uh, or another definition, the truth about events as opposed to interpretation. And later on in this talk, I'm going to challenge the idea that truth can be separated from its interpretation. The dictionary tells us that social science is the scientific study of human society and social relationships. Well, that's all very well, but it doesn't tell us what the scientific study is. So let's have a look at a definition of science. Uh, and here's two. Uh, the first one says the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. And that's obviously not talking about social science. And in fact, that's one of the problems, isn't it, about science, is it tends to be about the physical and natural world unless we qualify it as social science. And then you get this question of, well, is that still about observation and experiment or is it about you know, something else? But then there's a second definition, which I quite like, actually, a systematically organized body of knowledge on a particular subject. And again, I'm going to come back to talk about how groups of scientists systematically organize bodies of knowledge. And one final definition, of course, we need a definition of post-truth, which the dictionary tells us uh, is relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And again, that's going to come up a fair bit in this talk. OK, that's the boring definitions over with. Let's, let's get to the fun part. I'm now going to give you some real examples of science and social science and non-science, of course, and post-truth in relation to the pandemic, uh, relating particularly to COVID and also, um, of course, social media. Now, a few years ago, someone posted this on Twitter. President Trump says, I came up with vaccines. Now, that didn't really strike me as a fact. So I responded, as you do on, on Twitter. I said, I'm on the front cover of Vogue. Uh, and within four hours, this appeared, um, courtesy of Craig Yamey, who I've never met. But I think he's done a pretty good job of creating a bit of fake news there with me on the front cover of Vogue. I'm not sure what I'm going to do with that. But I want in this lecture um, to consider not merely social science and science, but the social science of science. Uh, many of you know about something called the narrative turn or the interpretive turn. Uh, the idea that social scientists rely not only on the tools of objective measurement, but also on interpretation on storytelling, persuasion, enactment. We have to construct through language plausible explanations for what we observe and what we experience in the world. Now, I'm going to argue that natural scientists actually have to do this too. Even a physics paper is a mere story told to an audience with the purpose of persuasion. Now, back in the 1940s, sociologist Robert Merton proposed four social norms for science with the acronym QDOS, communality. That is, science is a collective international endeavor whose progress depends on open communication and sharing. Universality, that is, every scientific discipline follows a set of agreed quality criteria. And we'll come back to that disinterestedness. In other words, science should be done for the sake of scientific progress, 
not for personal interest. And finally, organized skepticism. Scientists should scrutinize and challenge each other's work, for example, through peer review and attempts at replication. Now, I recently set up with some colleagues a new Master of Science course at the University of Oxford. And one exercise we set our students was go and find a fact, go and get a fact, carefully note the context in which the fact was generated. Bring your fact back to class and defend it to your classmates. I can tell you that no fact brought in by a student survived the scrutiny of the classmates unscathed. It was interesting to see that many of our students shared a lot of assumptions which other students didn't share about what counted as a fact and what didn't. Now, this go and find a fact exercise wasn't mine initially. It came from uh, sociologist Steve Woolgar. And a few years earlier, Steve Woolgar worked with uh, the philosopher of science, Bruno Latour, uh, to produce this book called Laboratory Life. Um, it's subtitled The Construction of Scientific Facts. And it's about how social relations and norms in the laboratory mean that certain facts come to be discovered while other facts never are. Now, Latour and Wulga took a bit of an anthropological approach in which they saw the scientists as a kind of tribe whose myths and rituals could be studied. And as they said, some statements made by scientists appeared to fellow scientists more fact-like than others. Now, the scientific tribe develops what's known as inscriptions, that is visual representations, pictures, graphs, things like that, of agreed facts, which then become stabilized as, quote, the way things are. All right. Let's go back to social media and look at a few more claims that have been circulating. Here's one on face mask safety. Your health, your life, your choice, it says. Know the facts before you wear one. Masks, it says, decrease oxygen uptake, increase toxin inhalation, shut down the immune system, increase your virus risk by triggering dormant infections, are scientifically inaccurate because the virus can penetrate the holes in the fabric and have not been studied in rigorous peer-reviewed research. Now, Dan Hall from The Sun in July 2020 took this apart nicely. He infiltrated an anti-mask movement and he found conspiracy theorists and libertarians cherry-picking their scientific evidence to align with what they wished was the case. It was peak post-truth. Meanwhile, I was busy copying the style and symbolism of the anti-mask pamphlet, constructing my own set of statements. I too headlined my pamphlet, your health, your life, your choice. Know the facts before you wear one. Masks, I said, have no impact on your oxygen intake no increase in oxygen inhalation, no damage to your immune system. They decrease virus transmission. The mesh size is scientifically accurate since viruses don't travel naked. And there's strong evidence of effectiveness when wearing masks to protect others. Unlike the original authors, I could substantiate my statement and I had searched for what scientists call disconfirming evidence which would have prompted me to alter my interpretations. Now, here's what someone did on this, did, did to this. Someone, I don't know who, pointed out that the first pamphlet had originated, and you can see this on the top, from the University of Twitter and Facebook, from a source with an unknown name and unknown qualifications. These so-called facts were likely to make you sick as evidenced by the red cross and the yellow emoji face with the thermometer. The second pamphlet on the right, in contrast, had come from a real Oxford professor with lots of letters after her name. She gets a green tick and a mask emoji. This is, of course, an exercise in rhetoric. Now, uh, as Aristotle taught us, rhetoric, or the art of persuasion, consists of three things. Logos, the fact, 
facts or what you're presenting as facts, ethos, the credibility of the speaker, and pathos, the appeal to emotions. The implication is that a fact backed by an Oxford professor can be trusted and won't hurt you. Uh, but actually, it wasn't that simple. On the left is the non-facts mask pamphlet, and on the right is a tweet from Scott Atlas, President Trump's erstwhile advisor on COVID-19. Now, as you can see, Dr. Atlas isn't too keen on masks, and he cites three very well-respected sources, the World Health Organization, the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Professor Carl Hennigan from the Oxford Center for Evidence-Based Medicine. Now, I'm sure that none of these sources would fully endorse all the statements in the left-hand graphic, but as Dr. Atlas says, all of them have expressed reservation about point number six, the limited evidence base for the efficacy of masks in the context of protecting the public. As the title of this lecture implies, once you put a scientific claim into the public domain, you can't control who deploys it or for what purpose. Now, I want to introduce you to two very different tribes of scientists. I'm drawing a little on this book by Tony Betcher and Paul Trowler called Academic Tribes and Territories. And I've shown the two tribes here with their traditional totems and war paint. The first tribe is called Evidence-Based Medicine and its totem is the hierarchy of evidence. And I'll talk about that on the next slide. The second tribe is one I called Pragmatic Public Health and its totem is the multifaceted real world case study illustrated here with this wonderful graphic from a Health Foundation report on domestic violence. Now, the evidence-based medicine tribe, as I said, adheres to a hierarchy of evidence. They're actually a hierarchy of methods with randomized controlled trials at the top. Good science is defined by the use of correct methods. Some methods are accepted as better than others. Indeed, a poor example of a higher up method may be seen as better than a good example of a lower down method. It is a deeply held myth among most members of this tribe that if participants are randomized in an experiment, that's good science. And if they're not, it's less good science. Now, here's an example of science produced by the evidence-based medicine tribe. Jefferson and Hennigan identified randomized trials of masks for, for preventing respiratory infections. They used a checklist called a risk of bias tool. You can see it down the side on the right hand side of this slide. Each research study they looked at got a score according to how biased they judged it to be. Now, using quality standards that were culturally agreed among their tribe, Jefferson and Hennigan concluded that there was no good evidence for the efficacy of masks. They placed non-randomized trial evidence, everything below the red in their hierarchy of evidence, in a metaphorical trash can. Because this tribe ranks by method, they didn't even have to look at any other kinds of research, and thus was born the fact that there was no evidence that masks work. Now, let's have another look at Dr. Atlas's tweet. I think you can see what's happened here. It wasn't, I think, that the evidence-based medicine tribe was deliberately trying to mislead. But for reasons I'm going on to explain, I do believe that their assumptions did not serve them well in this particular example of constructing a fact. And that is why their fact, in inverted commas, found its way into a tweet that was subsequently removed by Twitter as fake news. And I think this is an extraordinary piece of social drama to befall a supposedly world leading center of evidence based medicine. The ways of doing science that I've depicted rather provocatively as tribal totems and rituals were described by the philosopher Thomas Kuhn in his book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Now, Kuhn called these approaches paradigms, meaning a set of assumptions and beliefs shared by a group of scientists about what the important questions are and how they should be tackled. 
when you're working within those assumptions, said Kuhn, you're doing the systematic puzzle solving of normal science. And Kuhn in turn was drawing on Wittgenstein, who had referred to the railway tracks of science, the discourses and belief systems along which you drive your train. Now, as Kuhn observed, paradigms don't merely <clears throat> constrain our thinking, they enable us to think. It's only when we have a shared model of reality, shared assumptions about what is and isn't good science, that we can have the kind of discussion that advances our scientific field. Or as um, Susan Lee Starr said, the very definition of an academic discipline is a commitment to engage in disagreements. You will note that the evidence-based medicine tribe rarely enters into dialogue with other tribes. They largely consider them irrelevant, but they spend a lot of time arguing about and refining their own hierarchy of evidence and their risk of bias tools. Now let's look at a different tribe. It too has totems and rituals. And since I myself identify with this tribe, I'm gonna find it more difficult to be critical of it. This tribe holds passionately to the belief that there is no universally applicable hierarchy of evidence though some methods may be more or less fit for purpose. Good science is defined by this tribe as the use of multiple methods, adaptively and pragmatically, and also ethically and democratically to build a nuanced narrative of what has happened in a particular real world case study and why. Theory is assume, assumed to be at least as important as method, as Ken Judge put it, strong theory, flexible methods. The narrative, say the pragmatic public health specialist, needs to make sense and be plausible to the natives. Now, in pragmatic public health, a lot of additional evidence gets brought to the table. Studies that are ignored by the evidence-based medicine tribe become salient. For example, sneeze videos in which the unmasked person is shown to emit huge turbulent clouds of respiratory droplets and airborne particles. Or choir stories in which most people attending a choir practice developed COVID-19 even when they didn't get within six feet of the index case, nor touch any common surface. Now these pieces of evidence taken in isolation are not proof that masks work, but they demand a scientific explanation and they add to the overall picture. The same goes for natural experiments around the world. Christian Leffler's study of COVID mortality country by country in the days after the first documented case in each country showed that the countries which introduced mandated or widespread voluntary masking by 30 days, the blue and orange lines on this graph had orders of magnitude fewer deaths than countries which delayed introducing masks beyond 100 days. Again, not in itself proofs that masks work, but pretty good evidence that they don't kill you. Now let's go back to social media. In 280 characters, the evidence-based medicine narrative is summed up by Professor Paul Glasiew in his interpretation of the facts Based on the sparse literature from randomized controlled trials, the evidence that masks protect anyone is weak, and he is minded to speculate about multiple possible harms, including the question of risk compensation. For example, if you wear a mask, you'll think you're protected, so you won't bother washing your hands. The pragmatic public health narrative is summed up by Professor K.K. Cheng, who brings a much wider menu of facts to the table and concludes that there's strong evidence of benefit and even stronger evidence of no serious harm. Incidentally, Professor Glasiew's comments about harms of masks were not borne out. A review by Teresa Marto's team showed that risk compensation doesn't occur. In fact, wearing masks is associated with increased compliance with other preventive measures. Furthermore, video analysis of thousands of people walking past subway cameras shows that the ones wearing masks touch their faces less than the ones not wearing masks. 
Okay, so back in March 2020, seems a long time ago now, I got together with some other members of the Pragmatic Public Health Tribe, and we wrote this article for the British Medical Journal. We argued, as pragmatists do, for the precautionary principle. We said we don't have 100% proof that masks work yet, but let's act pragmatically on the basis of the numerous facts which point in the direction of a positive benefit-harm balance. Now, our paper didn't initially have much impact. It was another three months before Public Health England introduced a recommendation to wear a face covering in crowded public places. What did happen immediately was a massive social media backlash against me. These screenshots are taken from websites which have been set up for the purpose of attacking both my academic papers and also my character. The first one depicts me as a bit of a bull in a china shop, leading a charge um, to make face masks mandatory. Incidentally, I've never said they should be mandatory. Uh, and I'm also accused of decimating other people's arguments. Um, the criticism in the top quote is that I am too sure that I'm right. The author of the second quote, uh, which relates to the same publication, I think, calls me the milk curdler. Uh, and his problem is that I'm too circumspect. He thinks I'm not sure enough that I'm right. Uh, you'll note that neither of these critics engages with the substance of my arguments. Now, the anti-mask lobby managed to gatecrash a Zoom lecture I was giving recently at Green Templeton College in Oxford, just as I'd loaded up my opening slide. And before I'd even said anything, an audience member presenting as a white male posted this friendly message in the chat. I am a piece of excrement. I am a sheep. I am seeking to introduce a new world order. Um, be assured, I am using this material as data and I'm writing academic papers about it. But actually, I got off lightly. One of my PhD students, Helena Marie van der Westhuizen, she also published a paper on masks in the British Medical Journal. She put out a tweet to tell people about it. And within minutes, literally within minutes, ad hominem responses appeared, saying things like, what a worrying person Helena is. Soon there were hundreds of abusive responses in this thread, depicting masks as muzzles and accusing her of waging psychological warfare to force conformism. Helena Marie was tough enough to go on live national television the next day and talk about her mask research. Uh, she's a lady to watch. Now, you may have heard of the Great Barrington Declaration, led by three professors from Harvard, Stanford and Oxford, which was signed in about September. It states, if I may summarise, that COVID-19 isn't as bad as claimed, especially for the healthy under 60s, that the evidence base for interfering with people's lives is weak, and that the economy should be prioritised over further lockdown. And one argument made by this group centers on the lack of rigorous randomized controlled trial evidence. There's another declaration out there, the John Snow Memorandum, to which I'm a signatory, which brings in mechanistic and case study evidence and also evidence from ethics and political philosophy to argue the opposite, that COVID-19 is serious and sometimes deadly, that all citizens count, and that the best way to save the economy is to address public health, uh, and that we all need to make compromises for the sake of society. Now, these public declarations led to a new meta story in the media that opinion is polarized and there's really nothing we can be certain of. As you're probably aware, this kind of both sides journalism is quite dangerous. It can create false dichotomies and erode public trust. So we scientists have to make judgments about when it's best to keep quiet and just let the narrative run its course. We published the John Snow Memorandum only when we saw the professors who put out the Great Barrington Declaration entering number 10. Now, talking of the link between science and politics, I'd like to flag up two papers. Martin McKee and his colleagues offer an analysis from political science that the libertarian right is generally anti-masks, anti-lockdown and pro-segmentation. In other words, the old and vulnerable should stay at home in order that the young and less vulnerable 
can enjoy their freedoms. And that this basically mild disease should be allowed to wash over the population uh, to achieve herd immunity. Jason Harsin, in a paper entitled Toxic White Masculinity, has argued that the proponents of this view tend to be, although they're not necessarily, uh, white and male, aggressively confident and hierarchical and dismissive of traditionally female traits such as emotionality, power sharing and admission of uncertainty. Uh, now, as Roy Shulman said in a conference back in June, the COVID-19 pandemic is a unique phenomenon constituting the most blatant expression of dangers of the post-truth age. The period of the pandemic has been characterized by less confidence in institutions, a lack of agreement on facts, and a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. The pandemic, he says, intensified the need of citizens to find certainty, but they tended to find it in comfortable facts, in inverted commas, from institutions and entities they regard as trustworthy and that are consistent with opinions that they already espouse. Now, this time last year, we scientists liked to cite the apocryphal facts that half of all scientific papers are never read, 90% are never cited, and that it takes an average of 17 years to bridge the research practice gap. But in 2020, things flipped the other way. As soon as we had uploaded a preliminary version of our paper on a preprint server, it would immediately be grabbed by journalists, some of whom were very reputable and some of whom weren't. It would be circulated on platforms that we didn't even know existed and used in ways we'd never imagined. COVID-19 has already changed fundamentally and perhaps forever how academic findings are generated, reported, disseminated and shared with the public. This goes far beyond what Helga Nowotny and colleagues were talking about two decades ago when they introduced the concept of mode two science, that is, where facts are less certain and where science has a composition more heterogeneous, its methods more diverse and its boundaries more ragged. No, I think this is mode three science, a politicized and sinister engagement with non-science by a poisoned and partisan society. We are no longer in Thomas Kuhn's relatively apolitical world in which those who wished to break with an old paradigm could simply take their football and go and play in a new field. We are in the world described by Michel Foucault back in 1966, a world in which knowledge, that is particular versions of the facts and power are intimately intertwined. Powerful people and powerful institutions can define what knowledge is and whose knowledge counts. As he put it, in any given culture and at any given moment, there is always only one epistem that defines the conditions of possibility of all knowledge, whether expressed in a theory or silently invested in a practice. What Foucault didn't predict, perhaps, is how social media trolls would come to weaponize that dominant discourse. And now I want to highlight four approaches that I and my team including my incredible PhD students, have been using to cope with the way our science has been caught up in these entanglements. The first is reflexivity. This is a picture of the River Thames near my house. Every morning I go there, often before it gets light. Sometimes I go for a swim, but I always take an hour away from my work to think. And one thing I often reflect on is my ethical duties as a scientist working for the public good and how I might best discharge those duties in the current context. Secondly, and not nearly so pleasant, is painful engagement. The only way we can respond to what people are saying about us is to read it. We don't need to read every word, but we do need to know the ad hominems 
and the way our facts and also our uncertainties about facts are being twisted. Thirdly, epistemological labor, the work we scientists have to do to expose particular paradigmatic assumptions and systematically challenge them, which is partly what I've been up to during this lecture. And finally, deconstruction. To overcome attempts to distort our findings, we need to identify and then circumvent the constraints of particular discourses and linguistic conventions. Uh, it's interesting to note that I think some of the most effective rebuttals of the Great Barrington Declaration didn't come from people like me putting out the John Snow Memorandum. They came from ordinary users, ordinary citizens who signed the online Great Barrington petition with names like, uh, I'm quoting, Dr. Johnny Fartpants and Professor Not a Fucking Clue, um, thereby reducing the whole exercise to comedy and farce. Now, if we deconstruct the science of masks, we can see that they can be framed as personal protective equipment and tested in randomized controlled trials, that's fine, but they can also be framed in more political terms and linked to controversial choices about who gets the supply contracts and hidden vested interests. So let me summarize. COVID-19 hit the world back in January 2020. By March, there was a full-blown pandemic. Research, as we all know, progressed at unprecedented pace and scale. Too little knowledge quickly became too much. Facts, especially in relation to preventive behavior and public health, were contested and became saturated with ideology. Uncertainty became a weapon to be used tactically by interest groups. And we scientists, our flawed assumptions, our political allegiances, our interpersonal rivalries, and even our private lives became the story. Science communication is now a bare knuckle fight with the trolls. We scientists must reflect, engage, do epistemological work and deconstruct. So I thank you all for your attention. And now I'm looking forward to hearing Millie's commentary. Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you, Trish. That was just excellent. Uh, so rich, uh, so much to take in and a, a great uh, basis for further discussion. So uh, just on that, just do remember to submit your questions through the Q&A function uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. Although we've already had the best one, I think, which was uh, whether we can get your bow cover onto a set of face masks. Uh, Trish, um, I think that's a great idea. We should do that. Um, but now, before before we get onto your questions, uh, I'm really delighted uh, to welcome Dr. Millie Zimmeter, who is head of public policy at the Open Data Institute and has previously been senior policy advisor at the Royal Society and program manager at the Alan Turing Institute. And uh, Millie's going to expand on some of the themes raised by uh, Trish and making the, those vital connections to how we understand and use our data. Uh, over to you, Millie. Oh, you're muted, Millie. There we are. Oh, you're still muted. That, is that yeah. working? Great, okay. Um, so I'm just going to try to share my screen so that you can see the presentation. Perfect. And... Excellent. Is that through? Great. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much um, for the invitation to speak today. Um, and Trish, thank you for those really, that really intellectually rich um, keynote, um, which is, you know, there's lots of food for thought there. Um, and it's a real honor to be here. Um, so what I thought I'd do in my response is maybe um, reflect on some of Trish's comments about the kind of the mode two science or the tribe two, um, and think about whether there's any ways to um, to, to develop resilience and robustness in the face of the challenges that Trish outlined um, coming from mode three science, that highly politicized, polarized, um, emotive, and um, perhaps not, not very collaborative um, kind of domain that we sometimes find ourselves in. 
Um, so my background, my academic background is in philosophy. And Trish, I really like your comments that, you know, maybe it's not always possible to separate um, truth from its interpretation. And I don't know if you've seen that XKCD comic on purity, and it's got all the kind of, you know, the social sciences at one end of the scale, and then the hard sciences, and then all the other end of the scale is mathematics. <laughs> you know? And philosophy is kind of at the other end with mathematics. And yet philosophy also has produced thinkers like Nietzsche. Um, and in his essay on truth and lies in a non-moral sense, he says, well, look, all of, all of what we call truth is a kind of lie because truth is the kind of facticity of the world, right? It's all these sensory experiences. It's our kind of lived reality. And the moment we try to put that into language and into symbols, we're acting metaphorically. We're kind of distilling reality a bit um, and we're losing some of the nuance and the richness. So automatically by building systems, symbols and languages, we are, we're no longer a kind of, um, we're no longer as close to the facts as our kind of experience of them. So since all of language is itself a kind of lie, how do you then work truthfully within that? Um, and I think that's really relevant to the data domain um, because it's easy or rather tempting to think that, you know, if you get the right data or if you get more data, if you get richer data, more granular data, you'll have the answers. Um, but perhaps it might be helpful to think that the data is never complete, right? We'll never have all the facts. And even if we did, that might still not be the full story. So in, this, in these um, comments responding, I'm going to look at three different aspects um, of, of Trisha's talk. So one is policy and government. Um, one is data and digital technology, such as the use of algorithms and AI. Um, and the third is data and policy. So I'll, I'll go through those in order with a couple of minutes on each. So first of all, policy and government. Um, so I talked about sort of Nietzsche's idea that, you know, in a way, all of, all of truth is a kind of lie in the non-moral sense. Um, so in epistemology, which is the branch of philosophy concerned with knowledge and the nature of knowledge, um, there are sort of two main schools of thoughts, and one is foundationalism and one is coherentism. And foundationalism is that sort of very Cartesian um, way of thinking about, about truth and knowledge. It's that kind of, you know, get the foundations right and then build systematically up from them. It's, it's Descartes' contribution to this field. But coherentism takes a different view which is that you might, never, you might never be sure of your foundation or you might never be sure that the foundation is accurate, but you can still build a kind of a structure that sustains itself that's internally coherent. So it's like the difference between building a tower in foundationalism and maybe a spider's web as a kind of horizontal structure that's still, still robust and still, still quite sort of secure. And there's this great um, kind of metaphor from Otto von Neurath in 1921. He says, look, imagine, imagine you're, you're in a wooden boat at sea, as you can see there, um, and you, know, you discover a hole in the hold. Um, so you've got to patch it up, but you can only patch it up with wood that's on the boat itself. So you patch it up with other wood from another part of the boat, but then you've got a hole in another part of the boat. So you've got to patch it up with another bit of wood from somewhere else in the boat. And you're constantly patching up this boat, but you stay afloat. And it would be great if you could kind of go back to where you started from, or if you could anchor and sort it out, but you can't, you've got to just stay afloat and try to get to shore. And that's the kind of difference between foundationalism and coherentism. And I think that it's also a way to understand government, you know, because by the time, by the time a problem lands on the desk of government, it's because the free market can't solve it. It's because it's highly complex, highly challenging, um, and it's, it's not clear what success would even look like. Um, it's got kind of competing, com competing demands or expectations on it. Um, and so often in government, you're, you're just trying to get the least worst outcome and you're patching up this kind of damaged, damaged boat as you go and hoping you can stay afloat long enough to make progress in your journey. And I think it's, it's really important to understand that about government um, and to kind of develop a tolerance to that sort of working with imperfection in order to be, to be effective in policy. Um, but this has become even more difficult recently because we are in mode three conditions as, as, um, as, as Trish called it. It has become maybe more polarized, more emotive, more dogmatic and more combative. So that's, that's a very nice picture of a boat in still waters, but imagine a turbulent storm around it and you're, you're trying to keep the boat afloat in those conditions. Um, so let's look at data and digital technologies in all of this. So there's, I think when you're thinking about um, sort of data and digital technology, there's a very nice sort of Heraclitian paradox. So Heraclitus was the ancient Greek philosopher of paradox and of opposites, you know, that a thing is both as opposite. Um, and I think you get that with digital tech because these new digital technologies have been made possible because of the abundance of, you know, kind of rich new data, the, the big data revolution. 
but the great irony or paradox is that we don't have much data about how these technologies work in practice. So something like artificial intelligence has been made possible by the vast new data sets that it can, it can kind of um, analyze very quickly. But because there aren't many examples of AI put into practice, we don't yet know what the impacts of AI will be. So that's the beautiful paradox at the heart of data and digital technologies. So, um, so then the question becomes, well, then how do you, how do you work with them? particularly in government. And these conditions actually, you know, they, they make AI and digital tech ripe for mode three conditions, a lot of hyperbole, a lot of contention um, and dogma and so on. So some of the things we've been looking at at the Open Data Institute, the ODI, um, are thinking about the kinds of civic institutions that you need around digital technologies um, in order to use them well, in order to use them sustainably and ethically. And those civic institutions could include, for example, um, having, um, uh, data literacy in, in the wider population, so that there's better understanding of how they work, and, um, and it's easier for the public, for consumers and for citizens to be able to hold governments, companies, and civil society organizations using these technologies to account. Um, the civic institutions could include the media, for example, so that journalists are informed and equipped to ask the right questions about what's happening. So it's, it's thinking whether we've got the right civic institutions for these new technologies. Um, it's also thinking about engagement as a new norm, not something that you do as a one off, you know, like you announce something, parachute it in, then walk away. But engagement as a constant dialogue. Um, and that's got to be how it is, because these are rapidly evolving and continuously evolving. So it's, it's a different it's a different way, maybe, of thinking about our responsibilities to each other um, as individuals, um, maybe in individuals to institutions and institutions to individuals. So that that ongoing dialogue um, as, as the new norm. And it's also about asking the right questions. Um, so um, in October, we published an essay by Eleanor Shearer, who was an awardee of our Black History Month Writers Fund um, competition. It's called The Dividing Line, and it's about, it's about the use of data about race in, in policy. Um, and and she's, she pulls out lots of the nuance around kind of concepts of race and ethnicity to show the dangers, I guess, of thinking about data about race without that complexity in mind. So two really compelling examples for me from that essay. Um, was um, you know in, in the census in the ONS census um, a, a kind of uh, an option was introduced for, for people to identify as Indian or as Sikh but a lot of people that would like to identify as Sikh would also like to identify as Indian they didn't see it as either or um, and yet the census did not allow them to choose both right so that important data wasn't captured it wasn't expressed in the question or again thinking about the difference between sort of you know um, sort of um, self-identifying race and um, perceived race. Um, and it's what matters in something like, you know, um, rates of arrest um, is the perceived race of a person and not, not how they identify themselves. Um, and so there it's kind of making sure that nuance is captured in data about race or so-called data about race and thinking about the elements of, of that. Um, and so one of the tools that we use to try to help navigate that uncertainty is something called um, the data skills framework. And I'll, I'll just flash it up now. So this is a kind of matrix of all the skills that we think that you need to work with data at any level. And what I like about this is it's not just talking about the quantitative skills or what you assume would be data skills. It also includes what might be called soft skills like leading change um, or building communities, um, designing services um, and so on. Um, so I'll go back to the other slide to, to, to relate it to this. So for me, this is part of civic institutions and new kinds of engagement. It's not enough to just analyze data. You need to be able to work with people and understand people and think about the impacts of your work on people in this iterative, collaborative way. So finally, um, I'll speak briefly to um, data and policy. And this is another, another area that's um, you know, quite, quite rich with contradiction and tension. So um, we have, data for policy, such as, um, such as census statistics. Um, and that's, you know, government data is by its very nature, or it tries to be um, a kind of gold standard of data collection and, and, and maintenance. Um, but it would not have been fit for purpose in pandemic response, because then we needed something quite rapid, even if imperfect, or it might need data from the private sector. So for example, um, the use of mobile phone data, location data, to be able to, to map in real time um, people's mobility in towns or in regions to kind of look at, you know, to think about the impacts of lockdowns or think about planning transport for key workers. 
So it's have we got the right data to be to be making these decisions? And it's also thinking about um, whether our policies about data are fit for purpose. So we have regulations such as the GDPR, which is about your individual data rights, but that doesn't consider things like group group rights around data. Um, or maybe when I think about biometric data, um, so my biometric data is about me, um, but it's also about my family. If you've got my biometric data, you can infer or extrapolate things about people I'm related to. Um, and so the notion of data ownership is perhaps not, not the right concept anymore. So maybe our policies about data and data use aren't, aren't um, fit for purpose potentially. Um, and this creates again, mode three conditions with a lot of hyperbole, dogma, polarization and politicization um, around, around the use of data and also the digital technologies that can be derived from it. So again, thinking about how do you, how do you build that resilience um, and that robustness in? So um, an example of something we did quite recently at the ODI in, last month in November, was we did a, a rapid case study, um, a rapid bit of research on the impacts of emergency homeschooling um, on children, but also on their families and also on teachers. Um, and for that, we used data from Mumsnet, the social media website, um, Bernardo's and TeacherTap, uh, an app. Um, and what was interesting was our report came out on the same day as the Ofsted sort of monthly report on children's educational attainment in, in, in lockdown in, in, in the pandemic. Um, Theirs was more kind of, I guess I'd call it robust because you know it's government data and it's got a very kind of rigorous methodology. Um, but what was I think valuable about our work was we were we were working in a rapid real-time way with granular data that allowed us to speak to the multi-dimensional aspect, not just kind of children's education and attainment, but parents' mental health, for example. Um, and we we when we were thinking about this this piece of work, we had to ask ourselves, well, you know, it might not it might not meet the standards of say an academic paper that's gone through peer review, or um, you know the kind of the kind of data government collects itself for its own policy making. Um, but then what other? So we we know that it might not be perfect. But what are the consequences of not doing this research? So we had to ask a different ethical question. So instead of asking, um, what about if we get it wrong? We had to ask maybe, what are the costs of not doing it? And we had to think about um, the people who wouldn't be helped by it, for example, or the fact that um, we wouldn't have an evidence base to help policymakers who in the future might want to work with social media data or might need to do a kind of rapid response, real-time analysis in a, in a live emergency. Um, and again, a tool that we use there is um, the ODI data ethics canvas, which which is just a set of questions to encourage reflective, um, kind of collaborative and reflective thinking about a data project to help, help map unknown unknowns. So I guess um, in conclusion, the point I'd like to make is I think that maybe if we think about what Trish was calling mode three, mode three science as a kind of hankering for foundationalism again, you know, like, so you're in this, you're in this boat in the middle of the sea and it's very stormy. And maybe you're thinking, well, if only I had an anchor, if only I had a foundation, if only I could, go back to the shore. But maybe that's not practical, not possible. And maybe you just need to think, well, I'm in mode two. I'm, you know, we're in the ship and it's in the middle of the sea. I just need to make sure that the ship is watertight, you know, and, and work with that resilience, um, robustness, and the kind of the new kind of tools around that just to keep the ship afloat for a bit longer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Millie. That was excellent. Um, so we're collating your questions, trying to make uh, make the most of them. Um, in the meantime, I just wonder, Trish, to come to you to any further reflections now you've heard the response from Millie. Yeah, that, that was fantastic, Millie. Uh, I think you have very cleverly um, pulled out a few interesting snippets from, from my talk, but then you've kind of taken it into this area of data science. And it's interesting how I use the example of a simple face mask and things were bad enough. But once you take it into artificial intelligence and data science, the same principles apply, but, but they, it gets all a bit more complex and scary. I think the one point I want to make before you know, we, we take the, the questions from the audience, which I do want to spend time on, is um, you picked up my, the, the term mode three science, which I have to say I made up for the purposes of this lecture, but, but you, know, you know, the idea that, hang on a minute, this isn't science at all really, is it? It's just all cherry picking uh, for, for partisan purposes. But you 
uh, said, and I, I agree with you, that the solution to mode three uh, non-science is mode two science. Uh, and, and mode two, you, you talked about the, the kind of civic engagement, the, the really important skills with scientists of the soft skills of being able to, to network and get outside the ivory towers and build relationships and explain things and visualize, creating visuals. I absolutely agree. One thing we haven't talked about is mode one science. Mode one science is, if we go back to, to Nowotny and her colleagues writing about that 20 years ago, mode one science was the old kind of science that happened inside the walls of universities. Nobody understood it. It was, it was um, largely for other scientists and the rest of the world wasn't really invited because they would never have understood it. So the mode two is when we started to uh, become uh, what they call more ragged. Now, I'm interested that you use the word, oh, this, this isn't really perfect. It's not perfect. But of course, it depends what you mean by perfect, because I would say that the uh, I called it democratically and ethically engaged, that, that science that is more democratic and more ethical uh, is in a way more perfect than science which ignores those ethical entanglements and, and, and accountabilities. Uh, but that actually is a point that a lot of people working in the mode one paradigms wouldn't agree with. Um, so yeah, I think I think that we've got a lot to talk about, and I think probably now it's time to go and find out what the audience is asking. <laughs> yes, well, great, thanks, Trish. And yeah, we've had loads of questions, loads of great questions. I'm going to pick a few, try and group them a little bit, but um, no, the, the, I'm going to start with a quite a, a, a general one that struck me from other work from Campaign for Social Science. So a question from Richard Marr, um, he says, in the book Calling Bullshit, The Art of Skepticism in a Data-Driven World, the authors argue how data, fancy data viz biases have been used to promote misinformation by some people on social media, particularly. Should we actively call out bullshit in a post-truth world? And how should we do this safely and in a dignified manner? And it's sort of the reason I, I, it relates to your point about epistemological labor, I think, Trish, and it also relates to Jonathan Portis wrote a great piece for our early on in our uh, comment series about exactly that, about that hard labour of, uh, of challenging assumptions and and bad research. And I kind of was just to reflect a bit more on that would be really interesting. Well, yes, there is a really important piece of work to be done. And I think those two mask leaflets um, are an example, I think, of taking somebody else's inscription, somebody else's graphic, because this thing was just flying around Facebook and goodness knows what social media and deliberately plagiarizing its, um, not plagiarizing, but copying its format because that had now become the way things are, as, as Latour and Rulgar would say. Um, so it's partly about doggedly countering and a number of times I've put out on Twitter, look, th this is the evidence on masks. You know, I get really fed up with doing it, I'm blue in the face, but doggedly putting that out and keeping putting it out is one, and Stephen Riker does it as well, you know, with his lockdown stuff. Um, it, it, gets, it gets boring, it sort of, you know, distracts you from, from your grant applications, things like that, we have to do it as scientists. But there's another thing which I introduced briefly just towards the end of my talk, which is the use of humor to help deconstruct. Uh, and one of my heroines at the moment, Sarah Cooper, the comedian in, in Australia, who just does these wonderful takedowns. Um, and she's done some pretty good ones of Trump's um, statements as quite sort of pseudoscience, post-truth science stuff. Um, you know, obviously we all laugh about the bleach one, but there's a few other ones. And there's nothing like turning something into comedy to actually uh, get people to think, well, this isn't really true. It's it's really very clever, and I think we should we should look a bit more about partnering with the arts and with um, you know theatre, um, particularly the sort of fringe stuff, you know, the the the, the, the challenging stuff. Um, I think that's really important. Great, thanks, Trish. Any thoughts, Millie or Katie, to add to that? Um, well, just briefly, um, I think that the um, 
I think that maybe um, that that idea of constant engagement. So I agree with Trish on the importance of that kind of multidisciplinary thinking and thinking about what other communities could be brought into the dialogue. But again, I think it's realizing the engagement is just going to continue. It's got to be a continuous dialogue and it's never over. So I think in kind of in mode one science this and foundationalism, you're trying to build vertically. Um, but if in coherentism, if you think about it as a spider's web, you're always maintaining the web and, and building it, you know, adding a new strand here and so on. So that engagement um, is going to be continuous. And also thinking, well, do we need new civic institutions? So we, we know which ones we already have, such as, you know, media, um, say kind of, you know, um, democratic bodies and so on. But are those, are those the right institutions? Do they need to change? Do we need new ones to be added to that landscape? And so on. Great. Thank you, Millie. Um, good. Uh, Katie, anything or I can move on to other questions? Um, so many. I, I was just going to add that there are a bunch of other questions sort of linked to this topic, which are, you know, how as an individual, as a scientist, do you sort of keep resilient in the face of these trolls? And a couple of people saying, I too get trolled. It does it upset me? Does it upset you? And actually, I think it is a really important thing, you know, to talk about well-being for all of us through this. So I'd love to hear, Trish, how has it affected you personally, if it has? And what do you do about that? Um, well, if you look at my Twitter account, you'll see um, right next to my name, I've got this slightly aggressive, actually, statement saying, if you abuse me, I'm going to block you. Um, and actually, I do block people. I block at least one person every day because I don't want to, I don't want to have to look at those people. Um, on the other hand, I sometimes have to go into um, the tweets of people I have blocked to find out what they're saying about me. But that I'll do that at a time when I want to. I don't want them popping up in my timeline. I think the other thing, as I said towards the end of my talk, you know, those four strategies for dealing with it. Um, you know, the, the whole business of reflecting and actually having an identity as a scientist, being able to see that you are part of an international collaborative endeavor uh, and all that, without getting too smug about it, I might add. <laughs> um, you know, we all make mistakes, all that kind of thing. Um, I think that that reflexivity, that time away from the, the, the kind of cut and thrust, which is why I, I really do take that time out every day and think, now, what's been going on recently? Um, and then also talking to other people about it. You know, that the, the, we've got sort of back channels that um, various people, um, some people who are on SAGE and on the independent SAGE, we, we have a little back channel and, and talk about what's going on. Because I tell you what, I've got off very lightly compared to some people. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so building on that theme, I mean, there's a, there's a few questions that ask for your kind of assessment of how different sectors or institutions have done throughout the, the pandemic. And there's one very broad one, which the questioner recognises is very broad about how has the media done in the UK in this uh, during the crisis. But I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts on mm. what, what the media have done well and, and less well in an overall view of that. And then, and on that point of SAGE, um, so uh, question asking, have scientists and physicians allowed themselves to be sucked into this politicised arena with SAGE and independent SAGE? Or is that is that just unavoidable, I guess, in, in these sort of high pressure situations? It'd be good to just reflect on that. And worth saying, we don't mean sage publishing. <laughs> yes, this is... Uh... Uh, we like to call it the other sage, <laughs> or the other two sages. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. So I've only just realised you share an acronym. Gosh, yeah. silly me. Um, yes. I, as I said in my talk, there have been some absolutely outstanding investigative journalists who I think have contributed hugely to co-constructing this science. And that's partly because um, some people who uh, write as journalists and are outstanding journalists are also trained social scientists. I'm thinking of people like Zeynep Tufiki, who I believe is a, it has, has a, a, a professorship at one of the universities in America. I, might, I may have that wrong, but she's certainly a a very uh, highly trained social scientist, but she's also an investigative journalist. So, you know, when you're wearing those two hats, uh, that's brilliant. But why have those journalists done so well? Um, and I think it's because in a crisis, 
things happen very quickly. There's a lot of uncertainty. And one of the things that we have to do as a society is make sense of events and place them in context. And the most powerful and the most efficient tool that we have for making sense of events uh, and happenings is narrative. And guess who's good at storytelling is journalists. Yeah. So people who, I mean, Seth Abramson calls it curatorial journalism, where you get little bits of information from all over the place and put them all together to build a story. And of course, you can do that well or badly, but the people who, who've done it well, um, you know, Ed Yong is another one. Um, there are, I'm, I'm thinking of international ones. I'm sure I could think of, of some, some British journalists as well, but you know, it, it, this is an international challenge, isn't it? Um, those journalists have explored and they've tested out their facts and they've, they've looked for disconfirming data in a way that we all need to do when building case studies. So I think the boundary between what is uh, journalism and what is uh, social science uh, becomes blurred because, as I said right at the beginning, the whole narrative turn means that, that, that this is a hermeneutic synthesis done on the hoof uh, in a very sort of rapidly unfolding high-risk situation. So that's the good bit. The, the less good bit is that some of the people who are bound up with the post-truth uh, movement are also journalists uh, and they have their own vested interests. So you've got the full spectrum there. Um, the question of whether scientists can remain separate and pure from that, my own view is no, they cannot. Um, whether or not you're a social scientist like me or whether you are a um, you know, the vaccine scientists, for example, or, or the, the epidemiological modelers is another good example. Um, they could not remain separate from the facts because they were sucked into the story and the scientists became the story. And you, you just can't, you can't sit separate from that. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, really good points. Anything from Millie or Katie? I've got some other questions, a group of questions coming up, if not. Um, just, just really briefly, um, I think what's been interesting about the kind of the media coverage during the pandemic is it's not been restricted to national borders. Um, so because of the internet, you can access um, news reports from anywhere in the world as, as long as you can read that language. And I think what that's done is it's kind of, um, it's put pressure on governments. The social contract in each country has been tested in relation to every other country simultaneously and, and you know, in live in real time. And I think that's also put pressure on journalists as a global community in terms of the quality and, and um, the kind of, you know, the, the speed of their reporting, but also more opportunities to collaborate and, and work across national kind of borders. So again, back to the point of that kind of civic institutions, do we have the right institutions that we need for the way that technology and digital technologies are going to change the ways in which we relate to each other? And um, at the moment, the kind of, you know, the big um, internet, the, the technology companies, you know, how, how, how could they be regulated or how could they be supported to do more in the public service when you're thinking across national, national borders and not just at a kind of, you know, um, country level? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A key challenge. Um... Okay, so we got, I mean, your tribe one and two uh, grouping, Trish, has really taken hold with people, um, which is good. Uh, so a couple of questions related to that. Um, is there evidence that tribe one, this is from the Political Studies Association, is there evidence that tribe one dominates in the public arena? And if so, what does tribe two need to do? And then a more, well, one with a Frankie Goes to Hollywood reference, which is, is good for people of my <laughs> generation. Um, uh, you know, two tribes, how can, how can the two tribes engage and work together more effectively for better healthcare research and decision making, noting the famous Frankie Goes to Hollywood song, Two Tribes, because when two tribes go to war, one is all that you can score. Um, <laughs> well, it's interesting, tribe. isn't it? What, to what extent uh, does the evidence-based medicine tribe control resources? To what extent do they control the dialogue and the narrative, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I think we'd be here till midnight uh, mm. because I think you know you can frame it one way or the other. Um, certainly, many of us social scientists who also work in healthcare have had the have had the experience of putting in a theory-driven grant application to have it turned down. Uh, because someone's saying, well, you, you, you used the wrong method, 
because our hierarchy says you should have done a, a trial. But on the other hand, as, as Warren Pierce has been saying on Twitter, it's said, look, look, the EBM community really isn't that naive anymore. They're not that limited. And I would agree with him, absolutely, that what I've presented to you is, if you like, some Weberian ideal types um, to which some people conform very closely and others within that group um, are, are more amenable to a bit of dialogue. And I have actually picked uh, examples of individuals within those tribes who are particularly good examples of that ideal type, shall we say, but there would be other people who would say, you know, I'm a professor of evidence-based medicine and I'm, I would not endorse the kind of views that you're, you're depicting. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I've, I've been deliberately provocative, but I also do believe that there, there, these tribes still exist, the ideal types still exist, uh, and they are both useful because they help us to think, but they can be damaging when they start to constrain our thinking. Mm. Um, and I think actually it's probably worth throwing in a third tribe uh, that I'm beginning to collaborate with and having a lot of fun. I, I was always, when I was a kid, I was always going and playing in other people's gardens. You know, I never wanted to be in my own garden. My mum used to have to come and get me. Well, the garden I'm playing in at the moment is with the aerosol scientists. You know, those people um, who are into the sort of ventilation and temperature and humidity and particularly airflow. And they do these, these studies of where the air conditioning sends the, um, sends the currents of air. Yeah. So you, I, you could, and, and indeed it, it crossed my mind that I could put those in as a third tribe in this lecture. So, so I think, don't think of it as just, you know, A versus B, because actually there, there, there's multiple different tribes out there um, Susan Mickey's got a good tribe as well, the behavioral science tribe. You could go on, you could go on. Um, but yes, I, I still do think they're quite useful conceptually. Very good. Millie or Katie, anything on, on the tribes? I'd, I'd just say that um, I, I think people can change tribe because I spent the first half of my career in tribe one as an academic philosopher, um, and now I'm in tribe two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so and then we got, I've got a whole series, because it's quite an international reach for the event, we've got a lot of people in across lots of different countries, um, and there's multiple questions on how science and social science can respond uh, when government policy is uh, in, in contradiction to the science or the evidence, um, or, or goes against scientific research, and it is, you know, you have, you have used some examples, some high-profile examples, Trish, in your presentation of that. Um, what is the response? Is it it's just those four elements of your of the hard work of this, I guess? Well, I think those four elements were mainly survival strategies for us as individual yeah. scientists. Right. Quite what science does when um, government, shall we say, or policy, national policy goes right against the science. I have to say, I'm, I'm very interested in looking at what's happening in America. Um, what did the CDC do? There is a question around um, who, if anyone, was, um, shall we say, tweaking, I won't say censoring, what was going up on the CDC's website about, for example, the mode of transmission of COVID and, and what was driving that and how did the CDC react? Or you look at Anthony Fauci, you know, who, who is trying his best to be apolitical should he confront and say the president actually is talking through his hat or should he take a more kind of conciliatory role uh, and just do it all with his body language? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think the, 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 this is, mm -hmm. there isn't a hard and fast answer to it, but certainly as a scientist, I think you have to, there is a point at which you have to say, I'm seriously uncomfortable here. I'm not going to go along with that. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes you're better off inside the tent. And the trouble is with resigning or walking away, you're not in the tent anymore. And that means you can't influence discussion. So it's all very pragmatic. I can see Millie's nodding. I bet she knows more about this than I do, actually. I'm going to hand over to her. Hmm. 
I, I, I just I agree with you on the challenges. And I'd say that's been I think that's been what's allowed me to move from a more tribe one mentality to tribe two is understanding, understanding the challenges that government is navigating makes you think in that case, how, how can how can we make a constructive contribution to that? Um, and as you say, it's a judgment call. Sometimes you're better off, you know, inside the team making, you know, trying to get the least worst outcome. Um, and maybe sometimes you're better off kind of on the outside pointing to, you know, the kind of better world that might be possible. And, and it's, I think as long as it's an informed choice um, and not a reaction, as long as it's thoughtful and as you say, uh, Trish, reflexive, you know, um, and again, thinking about the different civic institutions that need to be in the landscape, thinking, well, which institution, which, which institutional role am I playing here? Um, so maybe as a scientist, maybe there are times when you do need to be on the outside, but then maybe if you're acting as an advisor of some kind, that's a different role. It's a different civic institution um, that has a different kind of agency or traction. So just that reflectivity, I think. Great. Thank you, Millie. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of, there's not much of a group. I'm going to group them together of different, uh, different sorts of things, but related to um, how we learn, I guess, or how we go forward in the future. And it is... Um, uh, so I'm interested in both of these sorts of strands of that. Um, so one of the questions, another of your frameworks that people really focused on and, and has helped is the mode one to three type uh, distinction. So um, are universities who still prioritise mode one single author type research outputs able to change to those types of more relational institutions or is that going to become outmoded uh, over time? And people are interested in whether you're going to write more about mode three Trish, which would be interesting to me. <laughs> yeah, I've got. Um, I think I can actually announce this because um, awesome. I've actually been asked to to write a chapter for Denzin and Lincoln's next edition of the qualitative um, research book. I say I can do that because it's published by Sage. Published by um, Sage, please, please do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> along Perfect. along with um, Emma de Graft Aikens, who I hope is listening. So we're co-authoring this. And uh, some of the ideas that, we've, uh, that I've been talking about, plus uh, a lot more, uh, will um, find their way into that chapter and there'll be other stuff that we haven't talked about because it's actually, and if you're writing for Denton and Link, you've got a lot more kind of theoretical stuff in it. Um, one thing I would say, th this question about whether um, mode one science is really the sort of, because these are not my categories. These, these are Helga Nowotny, Peter Scott, uh, Michael Gibbons and a fourth author that I can't remember off the top of my head, but I mean, the, the, this has been around for a while, uh, and many of you will know this uh, work. The mode three, I, as I say, I threw it in um, for, for, for today, but there is a question about whether mode one science always looks better. It's always sort of look, it, you know, it is more pure, if you like. Um, and of course, I'm, one of the things I do is I sit on the REF. Um, if you're listening from outside the UK, you may not know what the REF is, but it's a sort of university Olympics where um, everybody in one university is judging people in other universities for um, how good their research is. And, and this matters because in the end, as it trickles down, it depends how much money the university gets a couple of years later. So, so it's, all, it's all a bit kind of um, no pressure. But the question is, in the ref, do we value mode one science higher than mode two science? Um, and I have a horrible feeling we, we still do, although we try not to. But um, that's when we're evaluating scientific papers. On the other hand, it's now 25% of your ref points come from impact case studies. And the problem with mode one science is that unless you've engaged with policy, with civil society, with industry, with, with someone outside your higher education institution, you probably won't have much impact. So I think the mode two science is going to come into its own in the impact case study. And just to be boring about that for, for one more moment, you only have to have two star science. In other words, it doesn't have to be the absolute top notch four star science for it to count in an impact case study. Uh, and as Millie says, you know, there's plenty of pretty pragmatic studies uh, that have had huge impact, even though they weren't uh, scientifically perfect, shall we say. Um, they were democratic and ethical and all the rest of it. Uh, and that actually leads to impact. So I think through the impact case studies um, and the money attached to those, 
we are going to see a better valuing of mode two uh, science. Thank you. Anything else on that, Millie or Katie? Yeah. I, I, I might just add briefly that I think it'll be interesting to see what the emergence of data science as a discipline um, has on this, because data science is intrinsically interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, um, and some of the potential impact case studies from it are, are really high impact, you know, and so whether that will, and it's also quite, quite rapid in its development. So I wonder whether that might also change the dynamics of research and the application or implementation of research and the kinds of skills that are valued when working in an interdisciplinary um, mm -hmm. team as an interdisciplinary researcher or analyst. And I would just add that I think this has been the, the promise for so long that interdisciplinary research seems so obvious to those of us who understand that the world has problems and acad you know the academy has disciplines and actually a more problem focused, problem orientated social science is certainly what I think most of us who work in, <laughs> in the ecosystem think makes sense. Very good. Yeah, thank you. So I need to wrap up in a, in a few minutes. So I'll, I'll ask you a question, but also any final thoughts uh, you have, um, uh, just as, as things that have occurred to you as we've gone through. So it's a question from Joe Neary uh, that's more future focused about how do we sh ensure children and young people gain the skills to understand data and science, I would add, th these kind of scientific um, decision making that, that we're, we're asking people to uh, uh, engage with more, particularly in times of bullshit and bad research and uh, that, that online digital world that we're increasingly living in. Um, so any thoughts on that or any other reflections just to wrap up? Maybe if I come to you, Millie, uh, first and uh, then Katie. Thanks. It's a really good question. Um, so I guess, I guess I'd say that, well, you know, um, Maybe, maybe the responsibility for teaching doesn't only lie in schools, but ar lies around all the kinds of people around all institutions around children. So the family environment as well, perhaps the things they have access to online and so on, their community. So it's not all the government and the kind of compulsory, you know, compulsory education. Um, but it's, I think it's lifelong. It doesn't end. It shouldn't end, you know, when you're 16 and out in the world. It's, it's got to be continuous and there's got to be kind of social com commitment to that. Um, and I guess I'd say also maybe, you know, it's the last residue of mode one thinking. Maybe it's not just about, you know, learning to spot the difference between something that's, you know, accurate and robust versus something that isn't, but how we deal with the consequences of a mistake. And for me, that's where the engagement piece comes in. It, as long as you, as long as you're willing to keep having the dialogue, you know, and think, okay, well, I made a mistake. I made the wrong, wrong judgment call or, you know, wh whatever the issue is, but recover from that then that's resilient, that's sustainable, and that allows the relationships as well to be maintained healthily and constructively. Brilliant. That's a great point. Katie? Yeah, and I would, I would add that as a publisher who has published a lot on research methods and tried very hard to have materials available to um, faculty who are teaching methods, this is something that we care about a lot. And I think the other sort of area that that feels really important is critical thinking skills. And so one of the things Sage has done recently is produced um, uh, an online course on critical thinking skills. We also have a, an excellent book by Tom Chatfield, who some of you may be familiar with on critical thinking. And I think universities are embracing teaching critical thinking as a set of skills that can be learned and that aren't necessarily innate and that that is a really important part of learning how to be a informed citizen and to make good sort of future choices and i think that is definitely the direction of travel thank you katie and finally trick yeah i would absolutely agree with that you know i'm just remembering my very very first lecture i went to when i went up to medical school in 1977 which is a heck of a long time ago and uh i can't remember the name of the professor who stood up there but he said we now for the next six years you guys are going to be learning a lot of facts uh, about medicine and he said what we know is that by the time you retire half of those facts will have been disproved uh, he said the trouble is we don't know which half <laughs> and it was a great thing to kick off with because on the one hand you learn the facts on the other hand you he's kind of inoculated into into your brain that actually half of them are not actually true and that you therefore have to continuously reflect and challenge. Uh, but, but also this exercise that Steve Woolgar taught me um, 
over a bottle of wine, I seem to remember. Um, this is a good one for getting students to start thinking back then, go and get a fact. Um, that actually, again, is not about here are the facts, but how should we interrogate facts? So it's those, so those meta skills. Um, I think we've always taught those at postgraduate level and even undergraduate level, um, but we have to do it even more. We have to emphasize that even more. And as Millie says, we, when, when we graduate from university, that's just the beginning. We need to be lifelong learners, lifelong critical thinkers. This is, this is absolutely key. Brilliant, brilliant. And just a brilliant session, Trish and Millie and Katie. Thank you so much for that. We do need those oak cover face masks though, Trish, at some point. I think we will. Christmas is coming. <laughs> yeah, perfect Christmas <laughs> presents. Um, I'll, uh, I'll have to send you the cover of Vogue then, will I? <laughs> yes, yes, let's get them done. Um, so that's it for the session. It's just up to me now to say the thank yous to uh, Katie and the team at SAGE um, for their excellent support in this. Um, the Campaign for Social Science team for setting it up, particularly Marta, campaign manager, doing a great job putting this together. Um, to all our supporters, the campaign supporters, the universities and the learned societies um, who have been brilliant in a very difficult year for universities and continuing to support the campaign. And if you want to find out more about uh, supporting the campaign, please do get in touch with us. And then finally, of course, a huge thanks to Millie and of course, uh, Trish. Brilliant session. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And thank you, Bobby, for excellent sharing. Thank you. Very nice. Thank kid. You. <laughs> Have a great evening, everyone.